Cases below the $70 mark with breathable mesh front panels have become rarer in the last few years, but the trend is starting to pick back up. At CES, we saw a deluge of $60 to $70 mesh cases like the Fantex P300A, which takes the principles of the P400A and downcosts them, and the Silverstone Farah R1, which is meant to be a successor to our long praised Silverstone RL06. The RL06 was a longtime budget masterpiece. It managed chart topping performance at around $70 accomplished with four 120mm fans, a short chassis length that brought the fans closer to components, and a mesh front. Now we're reviewing the spiritual successor to the Silverstone RL06, and that's the Farah R1 mesh variant that we saw at CES. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's RTX 2060KO. We previously reviewed the RTX 2060KO model for its fused down RTX 2080 die that uniquely benefited Blender and some professional applications, offering better performance than expected in some pro workloads while offering usual strong RTX 2060 performance for gaming. The RTX 2060KO also includes the game Deliver Us the Moon for free with EVGA GeForce RTX cards. EVGA is actively restocking its RTX 2060KO with new dies, which you can find linked in the description below. The Farah R1 is one of several cases in what's supposed to be a line. Silverstone, like many companies, is going to keep the cost low on this series of cases, and it's doing so by reusing the tooling as much as possible. There's nothing criminal about this, and in fact, it's a good idea if it can be done properly. And some companies do cut corners where they shouldn't, but for the most part, reusing tooling and changing the face of the cases or the arrangement of the fans or other features is a great way to get extra mileage out of it while driving the cost down for a more mass consumer-friendly product. So that's the goal of the Farah, we chose the R1 for review over something like the V1 because we cared about the mesh front of the case. We thought it'd do better in our bench and it's more interesting to our uh, style of building and for most of our audience. Well-ventilated cases have been really rare in the last few years. The old Corsair 200R got several recommendations from us uh, even in the last couple of years and it's been around for half of a decade at this point. And that's because there weren't many good ones. Now that's changing. The Fractal Mesh FIC obviously has been a fairly budget, well, we'll put then big air quotes there, but budget-ish case at about $70. Unfortunately, it's best with extra fans. And unfortunately, $70 isn't that budget. Typically, we prefer to look for something like 50 bucks or 60 for our low-ish end case. And they can be good, but they're rare. And the RL06 was one of the best ones we've worked with. This year, that's changing. There's plenty of those coming out. This is one of them. And it's at a perfect time, really, because given our impending economic doom, everybody's going to be looking at cases like this for budget build. There's always a bright side here. Silverstone does, in fact, refer to this case as the Farah R1. It moves away from its letter-letter number-number scheme that it's used for years that everybody has complained about. Of course, if you ask GN's senior camera operator, Andrew, what the case is called, it's Ferrari. Because look at the side of the box. That's, that's what he thought it was. Maybe that would be what... DIY PC would name its Zonda successor. The front of the case is really close to the core components. This is a trend you're going to see a lot more of in the next couple of years. That's because case companies are finally figuring out that, hey, we don't need a bunch of empty space where the optical drives used to be anymore, and people aren't really buying hard drives. So why is it there? So they're getting shorter. The Corsair 220T is another one that did this. And bringing the front in closer to the case does benefit its thermals because naturally, if you have fans up there, which this one does not, then you can get the air straight into the components and there's very little distance for the air to wander off and find some other place to exit the case based on the pressure system that may have developed within the case. This one includes only one rear stock fan for out of box and it's a 120 mil fan. It's not particularly exciting. It's supposed to be $60 for the steel version and 65 for tempered glass. The current pricing from what we looked at when writing the script doesn't reflect that. It's about 70, but it's supposed to be 60. At $60, it's a significantly better position than 70, but either way, some higher quality features of the case. Build quality is for the price point genuinely superb. It's much higher than we'd expect for around this price point. Uh, although axing all the fans shows where the cost has gone. It is into the structure of the case, which is better on average uh, than most of its competitors. Now the NR600 is the closest competitor that stands out from Cooler Master that should be around the same price, but it isn't. And that's the one we'd point to for something that's the most structurally similar and the most competitive thermally. The, actually the white paint on this one is extremely well done. 
if you've seen any of our factory tours, we've talked in the past about how white paint's really difficult to do on cases where you're mixing and matching different metals or, or plastic and metal. And in this instance, the white does actually match really damn well between the panels, and one of which, again, is plastic, and that's pretty rare to do. So this is a, a point that if you really want a white case and you want it at this price point, it's going to be hard to do better than this one, but there's a lot of downsides. Uh, and there's some upsides, too. Let's get into the build notes, then we'll talk thermals, and then we'll go through whether it's worth it or not. The side panels are as simple as possible, both for the glass and the steel. The tempered glass side has four holes drilled into it that slip over posts, which are clearly repurposed motherboard standoffs, which is a design that we've seen since the very first tempered glass cases came in for review. There are downsides to this method. There's nothing to catch the glass if it slips when removing the panel, and replacing the panel will inevitably leave fingerprints around the edges and potentially on the inside. The upsides are that it's cheap, it's simple, and blocks as little of the window as possible. It's fine. What we really take issue with is the steel panel, which harkens back to the days of needing two people, or at least three hands, or two hands and your face, to close a computer. It hooks into the chassis with fragile tabs that get smashed flat if the panel isn't lined up properly, and it must be pressed down on three of the four sides to slide into place. Yes, it keeps the case's price low, but we'd be perfectly happy if we never saw one of these panels again, because we worked with them for uh, at least probably over a decade at this point. In a similar price cutting vein, only two of the stock PCIe slot covers are removable. The rest are the punch out disposable variety. We have enough loose slot covers to fill 50 cases at this point, so that's fine by us, but it's a potential shortcoming for some users. It's an interesting detail as well, to cut corners and probably shaved another half dollar off the cost of the case. There are two sets of cable cutouts at the front edge of the motherboard, one of which is covered up by full width ATX boards. Smaller form factors can take advantage of the nearer cutouts for less clutter, while ATX boards may still have plenty of cabling routing room without the extra set. Cutouts on the motherboard tray may be generous, but they're more scarce along the surface of the power supply shroud. We use a standard ATX power supply for case testing, and since the top of the power supply is almost flush with the shroud, it blocks the rearmost cutouts that would otherwise be handy for routing front I.O. cables. Longer power supplies will block even more. Room for bundling cables is limited, and storing any cables behind the motherboard tray makes the side panel much harder to get back on and the motherboard tray is flexible enough that smashing the cables against it isn't a very good idea. You could end up with a direct short. The hard drive cage is removable, but builds that use one or more three and a half inch drives will prove very difficult to cable manage, so make sure you couple this with, if possible in the budget, a modular power supply. Otherwise, you're gonna be jamming a lot of cables into places. The hard drive cage holds a single sled with mounting holes for one additional three and a half drive on the roof of the cage. There are three two and a half inch drive trays included and four mounting locations for them. Two behind the motherboard tray and two on top of the power supply shroud. This case isn't ideal for builds that use any three and a half inch drives at all since the drive cage takes up such valuable space. And that may not be ideal for targeting the budget market. Front IO is two USB 3.0 ports, one USB 2.0 and a combined mic headphone jack. The manual shows a USB type C port in one image, but this is not present in the final product. We like the vertical I.O. arrangement and the minimal labeling. We don't like the fact that the I.O. is wired to the front panel itself and pulls off with it. This is another aspect of the build that is pretty old, if you're familiar with cases or have had any amount of time working with computers. Even without the cables attaching to the front I.O., the front panel would still be hard to detach. The clips holding it on are exceptionally stiff, even after several cycles of replacing and removing it. We used a screwdriver to help pry it off at one point, which did help a lot, but that obviously risks damage. It doesn't have to be this way. Removing the front panel is necessary for installing fans or radiators at the front of the case and for cleaning out the front dust filter, which, by the way, isn't removable from the front panel. It's a woven layer glued onto the frame behind the externally visible metal mesh. The filter itself seems relatively breathable and unproblematic for the most part, but not being able to remove it and clean it will create headaches down the road for anyone who doesn't decide to just rip it out. Again, removing the front panel is a necessary part of using and maintaining this case, and that panel is attached to the case by the cables. So 
Although you could work with it and detach everything, it takes some extra time. So if you wanted to bring the panel over to the sink to clean it out, it's not as simple as it would be with something else. Even if there isn't much room to use them, we really like the tie points that Silverstone has come up with. Rather than pressing out a loop large enough for a Velcro strap, they simply drill out four holes in a flower pattern and then press them out together into a lump through which a zip tie or twist tie can be easily passed horizontally or vertically. The price bracket this case falls into doesn't exactly merit spending extra money on reusable Velcro ties that will be hidden away anyway, so zip ties are perfectly adequate for this. The end result is a neat small feature that's probably less expensive to produce than normal cable tie points and actually works really well. We've talked at length about EATX and the fact that it's not a real specification. Silverstone was one of our sources for that piece, and they informed us in no uncertain terms that Silverstone only uses, quote, EATX to refer to full 12 by 13 inch motherboards, even to the point of butting heads with other manufacturers about it. Accordingly, the FARA family of cases is not referred to as EATX, or SSIEEB, or SSICEB, which are all terms that Silverstone uses accurately for other cases. The FARA R1 is referred to as a standard ATX case, 12 inches by 9.6 inches, which is about as specific as it's possible to be. However, there are some standoff holes in the motherboard that are marked with E, which appear to line up with EEB spacing. Silverstone has made absolutely no claims about supporting EATX, just to be clear, which is good given how cramped it would be, but they also haven't constructed the case in a way that would prevent people from trying it. And we like that it's possible to try if you really wanted to, but that it's not marketed this way. So they've kind of left it up to you to decide if you want to try and fit one of the smaller EATX boards in the case without making a claim that just simply isn't true, like most of the other manufacturers would do. Silverstone has taken a similarly modest approach to their radiator support claims. The front of the case can fit three 120mm fans, but Silverstone doesn't try to claim that 360mm radiators will fit. It might be possible, almost, with the fans mounted on the outer face of the chassis inside the front panel, but it wouldn't be pretty. The distance from the front fan mounts to the front edge of the standard ATX motherboard mounting is 10 centimeters. From the front fan mounts to the back of the fan cutout on the front edge of the power supply shroud, it's three centimeters. And from the top of the case to the top edge of the motherboard, it's about 2.6 centimeters. Those reference points should be enough to help anyone trying to squeeze in a larger radiator, but additional clearance information for air coolers is also available in the manual PDF. We also noticed that there are two 120mm fan mounts on the surface of the power supply shroud. Silverstone mentions nothing of these, probably because they're obstructed by the power supply and they're unusable if the internal 2.5 inch drive trays are mounted on top of them. If only one drive tray is needed, and if the power supply isn't too long, the mount towards the front of the case might actually be usable as an additional intake fan for the GPU. Obviously, that's not officially recommended, but we, again, appreciate the same approach of having the option and not having the manufacturer try to claim that it will definitely work and completely improve your life with the build. Given that Silverstone intends to use this tool in for multiple cases, perhaps another related chassis will officially support EEB motherboards or fans on top of the PSU in the future. Let's get into the thermal testing. The first chart will show only the FARA R1 and the RL06. We'll save the comparative tests for next. The only stock fan in the whole case is positioned directly behind the CPU. So if anything at all is getting cooled, it's that. During the torture test, we logged an average CPU temperature of 65 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient, almost at the point of throttling, but we never dropped clocks. Even with no fans mounted directly behind the front panel, removing the panel proved beneficial with a drop down to 57 degrees over ambient, as the rear exhaust fan could more effectively pull air from the front of the case and create the pressure system needed to rush cool air in. A drop is expected from panel removal in every instance, but the larger the drop, the more obstructive the panel is. In this instance, an eight degree drop wouldn't typically be as significant, but the lack of front fans makes it more important for testing. Usually, removing the front panel results in better thermals than any of our other tests, but using the RL06's fans in the FARA R1 with its front panel resulted in a significantly lower CPU temperature of 50 degrees, even with the obstructions of the front panel and the filter still there. Stuffing more fans in a case really does work, especially with a mesh front panel. The original RL06 measured at about 48 degrees for the same test, marking the R1 a poor successor to the original. It's got potential, but it really needs the fans to realize it. And 
then you might as well just buy a more expensive case in many instances, like the P400A, because you'd be spending about the same with the fans plus the R1. Compared to the other cases we've tested, 65 degrees Celsius is terrible. An easy retort is that Silverstone intends the users to add more fans. But the similarly priced Cooler Master NR600 includes two fans and scored massively better in the stock test versus stock at 56 degrees Celsius over ambient. Adding one front fan to the NR600 brought it down to 47.1 degrees Celsius over ambient, replacing the R1 single fan with the four from the RL06 still didn't bring it that low. The RL06 itself averaged about one degree better than the R1 using the exact same set of fans. It's louder, mind you, but we'll talk about that more in the noise normalized section. There's still some margin for error here as well. Cooler Master skipped a filter altogether, relying on the fine mesh of the NR600 front panel itself to keep the dust out. It's hard to fault Silverstone for spending the money on a feature that the NR600 doesn't have but the filter in the R1 is permanent and non-removable. Unlike the older RL06s, it feels like a regression from the previous design. GPU temperature was 61 degrees over ambient with the standard torture workload that we use for our torture testing. It also improved by several degrees with the front panel removed, down to 54 degrees. There's no intake fan pointed at the GPU, and the only exhaust fan in the case is above the level of the backplate. So any improvement in temperature here is just due to unsealing the case and keeping the hot air from building up inside. A single exhaust fan isn't adequate. Buy more fans in order to use this case. Giving the GPU direct airflow with the RL06 fans lowered temperatures further, down to 51 degrees Celsius over ambient. Since we only control fan speed on the test system's GPU, it's free to adjust clocks up or down based on thermal headroom. So thermal differences usually aren't as dramatic as the CPUs. The original RL06 did about 47.1 degrees in this test when stock. Comparative GPU thermals are next. 61 degrees Celsius on the GPU is, again, right at the top end of some of the hottest cases we've tested. The NR600 averaged 54 degrees delta T over ambient with its stock fans, which in the context of the original review for that case wasn't overly impressive, but it's a definite improvement over the R1. The original RL06 averaged 47.1 degrees GPU temperature, one of the best stock results we've ever seen. But the R1 misses that mark by a few degrees. Still, 51 degrees delta T over ambient would have put it on the cooler side of the chart alongside cases like the Cooler Master H500 blank mesh, specifically the blank, and the Corsair 570X. This case would have the potential to be high performance if the right fans were purchased for it. The Firestrike Extreme stress test confirmed what the torture test showed with an identical GPU temperature of 61 degrees over ambient. That's just as high relative to the rest of the chart as the torture result was, but the CPU result is also warm, with 35 degrees in this test placing it above most of the other results on the chart. Even without a load on the CPU, hot air builds up in the top of the case and can't be effectively exhausted by a single fan. Blender is a serious workload by CPU benchmarking standards, but compared to the torture workloads we use for case torture testing, it's relatively light. The CPU render averaged 40 degrees over ambient, only a couple degrees warmer than the NR600's 38 degrees, but much further toward the hot end of the chart. Smaller differences mean more here due to the nature of the test. The original RL06 did 34 degrees, outdoing its successor markedly. The GPU accelerated render averaged 29 degrees on the GPU, while the NR600 averaged 27 degrees. Neither of these temperatures compare to cases with GPU-focused cooling like the SL600M which averaged 22 degrees over ambient in this test. If we haven't said it enough by now, this case needs an extra fan at the very least, preferably an intake directed towards the GPU. Our standardized fan test is one that we added by community requests. It's useful, but it can also be misleading. So we'd encourage you to watch our testing methodology content about this test to understand why before you paste the results all over the internet without understanding them. The standardized fan test is an extremely appropriate one for this case specifically, but only if the intention truly is for customers to buy their own fans. CPU temperature here is 48 degrees, lower than any other test utilizing a torture workload that we did in this case. That ties it with the Corsair 220T airflow, just slightly warmer than the ever popular fractal mesh of IC's temperature of 47 degrees Celsius as well. And these are all within error of each other. The R1 finally beat the NR600's average here, with Cooler Master's case a couple degrees warmer at 51 degrees. CPU thermals in the R1 don't have to be bad. With fans equalized, the R1 outperforms many more expensive cases. That stock line really illustrates how far it is from the rest when left alone, though.
GPU temperatures with the standard Noctua fans averaged 55 degrees. That's more toward the middle of the cases we've tested so far, and definitely above the NR600 at 50 degrees. We try to stick to a normal layout for the standardized fan test, with two 140 mil front intake fans above the level of the power supply shroud, and one back 120mm fan, so the NR600 gained the advantage here by forcing us to mount one of the 140mm intakes partially below the level of the PSU shroud, where it could more strongly benefit the GPU. Creative fan placement could narrow the gap between the two cases in this test, but this is one of the instances where standardized fan testing isn't always as standard as people like to think it is. And a surprise to nobody, putting a single fan in the very rear of the case makes it quiet. We measured the noise level of the R1 with case fans at max, case, case fan at max speed, and the CPU and GPU fan controlled as usually at our usual 20 inch distance at a reading of 36 dBA. That's exactly the threshold for our noise normalized testing. We can treat the standard torture results as noise normalized results, but even for this test, it seems that the R1 could have benefited from more fans running at a lower RPM. The 65 degree average CPU temperature is higher than any case we've run through the noise normalized testing so far, other than the DIY PC Zonda O. The GPU temperature of 61 degrees is higher than any except the BitPhoenix Enso. The Zonda O may be old and ridiculously cheap, but it comes with three fans, one of which is aimed at the GPU. It's also the flimsiest case we've ever worked with, so you win some and you lose some. We want to like the R1, and to some extent we do. This is a very function-focused product. It's something that Silverstone's well known for. Their adherence to strict SSI EEB nomenclature is one of the things that illustrates what Silverstone cares about, which is being pedantic in a good way and trying to get a functional product that people understand without overselling its features. They've done all of those things, and Silverstone deserves tremendous praise for that. Because as we stated in the script in the build section, there's a lot of small stuff on here where they could kind of get away with advertising support for a 360 mil, or kind of get away with advertising fan mounts on the top of the power supply shroud that would mostly do nothing on this particular case. But they didn't do that, because Silverstone understands that those things are questionable at best, and so it's best to just let the user try it if they want to, but not actually push it as a major point. Because then, if the user wants to try it, that's on them. But Silverstone's not going to market something that's only halfway or accidentally a feature that won't be wide support across. I mean, look at EATX, for example. You could kind of fit some EATX boards in there, but it'd be awfully tight, and it wouldn't be particularly fun to work with, and some won't fit. So Silverstone has accounted for that. So we give them a, bit, a lot of praise for that. Build quality is overall improved, but the RL06 still beats it in some ways, like the front panel on the 06 wasn't attached physically to the front I.O., so it had things that benefited it beyond thermals, and this is just seeing where, where Silverstone has come from and where the FARA R1 lands. Uh, disappointing really is the best word for it. Now, it's got upsides. We've described them, mostly build quality, uh, paint quality, stuff like that, and you can account for a lot of this with buying extra fans, but uh, it's just not really what we want to see as stock. Uh, in terms of the case overall, it's supposed to be $60 or 65 with tempered glass. Everything about this case implies that it's very low margin or that they've done their best to trim the fat where they can. Uh, we'd love to have a four fan RL06 back at its original MSRP of $75, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen. That was also in the days of the uh, lower tariffs and, and even with the old acrylic panel, that'd be fine. But it's a sad reality of making and selling cases that they're not going to stick around forever, even when they're some of the best ones. We believe the Farah R1's main competition is the Cooler Master NR600, which reviewed fairly well in our review. It's got relatively similar appearance, except not available in white. That's potentially a key difference for some people. It has a tempered glass side panel. It has a mesh front. It's got the ultra fine mesh, so there's no dust filter. That's so, a bit of a trend this year as well. And the NR600 includes two fans that the uh, managed to outmatch the R1's single exhaust fan, unsurprisingly, and it also trims another few dollars off the PC shopping list because if you buy this, you do need to buy at least one fan. And that adds to the cost of the case. It's not 60 anymore, now it's maybe 67 or 70. It's not 65 with tempered glass, it's like 70 something. So, should be about the same price between the NR600 and this is the key phrase here because as of writing, it's difficult to find, if not impossible, the NR600 near its MSRP of $70.
Cooler Master increased its case pricing by about 18% as a result of the tariffs, and that really kind of knocks them out of the range that we're looking at. So the R1, that might be the only advantage it needs here. It's good to see some tight competition for the budget space. It's unfortunate that the competition requires an extra fan. So it kind of exits what we consider to be a proper budget solution, which would be 50 to 60 bucks and becomes more of like a low, uh, low mid range, $70 case. And there's a lot of really good cases once you start getting up into the 75 range. So where that leaves this case is that in an objective sense, in a vacuum, it is a good case, meaning as it's designed, it's good, but it needs an extra fan. In a relative sense, where other cases exist, it is thermally inferior in a massive way, and that might be the difference of you buying something else instead. So that's what it boils down to. The way we'd cut it is this. If you like the case, you like how it looks, you like the features of it, and you can stomach a fan purchase because maybe it's not that big of a difference to your budget, then there are not a ton of reasons we would advise against it other than some related to drives, things like that, that we've mentioned. Uh, you shouldn't have a ton of reservations if you like everything you see. Cases are, of course, also very subjective, so that matters. But in an objective sense, it is not what we would call good out of the, bat, the box. In fact, it's quite bad out of the box. So uh, yeah, that's a, a massive downside and we expect better of Silverstone, but they've delivered elsewhere. So it's a bit mixed on this one, and that'll cap it for now. So thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. As always, go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.